Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us and be. All right, summer has apparently come too early. We have way too many empty seats this morning. Where is everybody? It's two minutes after. Welcome. We're glad you're with us. Uh, if you're here in the sanctuary, welcome, welcome. If you are watching online, welcome there as well. We're going to take just a couple of moments before we begin service this morning. Cover just a few announcements you can find in your bulletin. If you're watching online and you want a copy of the bulletin, two links for you to click on in the Facebook feed. One takes you to our web page where you can download a copy of the bulletin. The other one takes you to tithe.com. Lee. At tithe.lee, you can download the Forest Park Church app to your smart device and get everything you need from the bulletin and more. So either way, there you will have a copy of the bulletin. Welcome in today. We're going to take just a couple of moments and look at a few of the announcements here that I want to be sure that I cover. Congratulations to Dave and Barbara Bond, the birth of their great granddaughter, Allura Lane Worrell, born on April 30th. Seven pounds, two ounces. I asked Barbara in the last service if she was old enough to have a great granddaughter, and she said no, she was not. So there. We celebrate with them. If you have a graduating senior, please be sure that you get up with Sam. He has some information that he needs from you. We've got the Waves Girls Conference coming up. Also, the Oakwood Summer Camp is being held at Blue Lake. Uh, that's coming up over the summer. <laughs> need to begin to prepare for that women's ministry going strong men's ministry children's ministry going strong still doing the backpack blessings and as we come to the communion table today our communion offering is going to support a water for life that's a ministry of life outreach international providing clean water and wells to uh, parts of the world that do not have enough of either of those now on the back of your bulletin you will see that our Wednesday night dinner this week is going to be breakfast, supper, quiche, cheese, grits, blueberry, French toast. Uh, be sure you sign up by Tuesday at noon so we'll know how much, uh, mm -mm, how much food to prepare. We've got church t-shirts uh, for sale in the vestibule in the gathering area as you come in. If you're interested, contact a church staff member. We'll make sure you get one of those ultra cool um, t-shirts. They're really neat very very neat uh, and as always a um, a listing of our support for the ministries here at Forest Park thank you for your giving one of the things that you'll have in your bulletin today is this that is a flyer about our vacation Bible school that's coming up ways for you to give ways for you to help ways for you to get your kids grandkids signed up for that and this morning, please be sure that you fill out your connection card. That detaches from the end of your bulletin. You can drop that in the offering plate as it comes around. Or if you're a first-time guest today, fill that out. Take it to the information desk in the gathering area. And we have a gift that we would like to share with you. Uh, this week, but more next week and going forward, we've got some new electronic check-in guidelines that you're going to be hearing more about if you have kids with you. So when you come in on the days where your kids are going to go to Children's Church, there's a new check-in procedure. There is a computer in the gathering area. You go there, you find your child's name, and you click that box. And they're going to give you a name tag, one for you and one for your child. The one for your child looks like this, and the one for you looks like this. That way, this one splits in two. Uh, that way, you can have one for the mom, one for the dad, and you can go collect your child after children's church, after Sunday school. Show your uh, sticker and keep it unless you're going to go home. If the child does not have that name tag when they are dismissed from children's bread, they have to go back and sit with their parents. But the parent is welcome to, to still get up and go check on them at any time back in the uh, children's wing, which is locked off. Trying to keep your kids, your grandkids safe, doing the best we can there because we love you and we want you to be safe and your children and grandchildren to be safe. 
while you are here worshiping with us. My name is David Willis. It's my privilege to be the pastor here at Forest Park. We're excited that you're here with us today. Uh, whether you are here in the sanctuary or watching online, we are bound together by the Spirit. And so as we draw together to worship, we draw strength from that Spirit and from that gathering. Let's take some time to pray together before we go to worship today. Bow with me. Loving God, we give you all the honor and glory that is due your name. We draw our hearts together today through the power of that spirit of which I've just been speaking. Today, Father, may we glorify you by what we offer. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence and help us to be centered on you. May the things of this world grow strangely dim, as the song says, in the light of your glory and grace. We're here today to worship you. We lift you up, seeking revival for ourselves and glorification for your name. Inhabit our worship and praise as we offer our best to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Stand together and worship with us. Good morning. Check your 
after a couple of weeks with no voice. So forgive me today. The song I'm going to do, everybody knows, so I'm going to need everybody to sing. Um, thank goodness he's just looking for a joyful noise. Amen. One thing I learned the last couple of weeks, when you don't have any voice, you do a lot of listening. Sometimes you hear things you don't want to hear. Sometimes you hear things you need to hear. And God comes at you with the most gentle reminders of what's really important. This song is one of those reminders for me when Corey picked this song for this week. I went back and listened because I still had no voice. I couldn't sing along and rehearse with it, but I could listen to it. And every, like I said, everybody knows it. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. That's it. Regardless of what else is going on, good, bad, mountaintop or valley, where we are here, our purpose is to worship. So join with me this morning.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good job. Father, we're just so grateful to come into your house, to come into your presence, Lord, to stop everything else that's going on, Lord, to stop the madness outside we hear, to stop our, the thoughts that we can't seem to take captive of, Lord, the rage we feel when we see things that are not done right, the frustration, Lord. Sometimes our emotions get the best of us. And I pray now that we can just surrender that to you, Father, because we want to represent you above all else. Sometimes, Lord, the justice, we won't see the sight of heaven, but we would hold true to you, Father. We know that you have a plan. We know you have a purpose. And all the hurt we see is so heavy sometimes, but we know, God, that you are faithful. Help us to cling to the truth of your word and the truth of who you are. Lord, as we sing this next song, I just pray, Father, that you would just draw near. That's what we're asking, God. Just draw near to our hearts, to our circumstances, to our hurts, because sometimes, God, we need you and you and nothing else. Be with us today, Father, as we come into your presence. We love you, Jesus, amen. As we take in the tithes and the offerings for our church, will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank you, Gerald, and thank you to the praise team. Fantastic time in worship today. What a blessing it is to be able to come together with like-minded folks and worship the Lord, including you. We are delighted to have you with us today. What a great time it is to come and share not only uh, the word of the Lord, but in communion and fellowship with each other. Uh, before we begin this morning, I would remind you, if you're here today and you're of a different faith tradition, uh, don't sweat the communion. We have an open communion table, which means that you are welcome to come and participate regardless of your faith tradition. We've been talking about for the past few weeks, making decisions and then talking about God's plan and talking about how it is that he continues to work with us through making plans for ourselves, even though he lead about how we make decisions, even though God has a plan for us. So we've been talking about 
does God have a plan? Yeah, does he? Are we in it? Of course. All of these different things have been going on. We've been talking about making those decisions. And we kind of draw that to a close today here at the communion table. We've called this particular sermon series, Decisions, Decisions, God's Plan in My Life. How is it that those two things intersect? If God does have a plan and I am included in that plan, why do I have decisions to make at all? If there is a plan for me, what difference does it make? You know, God will tell me who to marry, etc., etc. God will tell me where to live. God will tell me where to work because it's his plan, and I want to be in his plan, and so here we go. It's not always the way it works. We have decisions that we have to make, and so we started out a few weeks ago just making sure that we were on the same sheet of music with God. Does God indeed have a plan, we ask ourselves. Yeah, he, he does have a plan for you. He does have a plan for me. And we are in those plans, but it's not a plan in the sense that he is going to tell us those specific things like who to marry, etc., etc. We've said that God's plan is sovereign and God's plan is secret. That means that there's nothing that we can do that's ultimately going to get in the way of what God desires for his people and what God desires for his world. His sovereignty is always going to trump all of that. We've also said that that plan is secret. It's not secret as in it's top secret and nobody knows anything about it. God has revealed to you and to me what we need to know about his plans inside of his word. He's told us how things are going to end. We did a study on Revelations uh, a few, I guess it's been a little bit over a year ago now. The book of Revelation, I should say, not Revelations, the book of Revelation, uh, a little bit over a year ago, and we discovered that there are a couple of different ways that you can read the book of Revelation. We discovered that the book of Revelation is probably not going to unfold like a train schedule. In the sense that you can say, okay, this has happened, this has happened, and this has happened. What we've discovered is this. That the book of Revelation was written to a particular people in a particular time about a particular situation. John on the Isle of Patmos wrote the book of Revelation as a letter of prophecy to people who were living under Roman rule. And he talked about how all of those things would come to pass and that in the end, God's people would prevail. And he was exactly right. What that means for you and for me is this. In the end, we win. Why do we win? Because we're on God's side. Now, you read the book of Revelation however you want to. If you want to read it uh, from a prophetic standpoint, hey, go for it. If you want to read it historically like we talked about just now, that's a beautiful thing. Go for it. Because in the end, it ends up the same. We win. So God has told us about this plan that we have. Even though it's, even though it's secret, he's revealed enough of it in his word to move us forward. But that does not mean that he has become a watchmaker God and that he has started the watch ticking and taken his hands off. He's very much involved in the world that he has created and in your life and in my life. We talked about God's law, how God's law is moral, how God's law is civil, and how God's law in the Old Testament was ceremonial. We said those moral laws are the laws that apply to you and me and every other human being that's ever been and will ever be henceforth. Those moral laws don't change. But then we also talked about God's civil law, and we said there's equity between some of the moral laws and some of the civil laws, and we talked also about ceremonial laws. So we know that God's civil law and God's ceremonial law expired with the nation of Israel's old covenant. And in the coming of Jesus, we've established a new covenant. Very, very similar to God's law is God's guidance for you and me in making decisions. God guides us morally in making decisions. God guides us sovereignly and specially. And we concluded that particular sermon saying that sometimes we get tripped up because we want God's sovereign and special guidance 
when he has completely and totally guided us in every way that we need morally and with wisdom and that wisdom is where we're going to end up today God guides us morally God guides us with wisdom he guides us sovereignly and specially but more often than not he uses that moral guidance and wisdom to help us make the decisions that we need to make than he does by sovereignly ordering your life and my life and performing miracles so that we are where we need to be. It happens, but not so much. We said when God guides us morally, this is what we talked about last week, when God guides us morally, we need to understand that in that moral guidance, he gives us freedom. We have truth freedom. We have also conditional freedom. That truth comes from knowing who he is. That conditional freedom realizes that he gives us boundaries and that we recognize those boundaries. When we recognize those boundaries, we also have to embrace the freedom that he gives to you and that he gives to me inside of those boundaries. And those freedoms are best described to you and best described to me within his scripture. And so today we end up talking about wisdom. How it is that God uses wisdom to guide us in the decisions that we make. Now, if you have your Bibles with you and you want to read along with me this morning, you got to be quick, okay? Because our sermon scripture today is all of one verse. So like the old Geico guy says, oh, you got to be quicker than that. you got to be quick today if you want to read along. But reading out of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, this is going to be in the New Living Translation. It's really hard to understand. That's sarcasm, as um, Leonard would tell Sheldon. Yes, that's sarcasm. It's not hard to understand at all. We're talking about wisdom and how God uses wisdom to guide you and how God uses wisdom to guide me in making decisions. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10 says this, Using a dull axe requires great strength. So sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. That's really difficult to understand, isn't it? Using a dull axe requires great strength. So sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you to succeed. N.T. Wright, uh, former bishop of uh, Durham, uh, and one of my very favorite theologians, as I've told you before, says this about biblical wisdom. He says, wisdom in the biblical tradition includes in its wide embrace both the encyclopedic collection and arrangement of the data, the evidence, the facts, and that strange, soft something which sneaks around the back and asks the question, but well, what's it all for? What does it mean? And what do we do with it? So he says in a very gentle manner, probably much more gentle than I would ever be able to be, he says, look, we can collect all the information we need, and we collect it well. We know what it says. We know what it does. We know what it means. We understand it fully and we understand it completely. But then wisdom sneaks around the back door and asks the important questions. So what now? Now that we've got all this information collected correctly, what now? What do we do with it? What does it mean to you and what does it mean to me as followers? It's just, we're, we're talking about wisdom and how wisdom helps us to decide. So how does wisdom help us to decide? What does it do for us in this decision-making process? It's one thing to understand the concept of grace and to be able to talk intelligently about the Christian concept of grace. It's a great thing to be able to discuss with other people what it means to be graceful and what grace means from a theological standpoint. But if as far as you ever get with the concept of grace is to discuss it intelligently, you have completely crippled the concept of grace because grace talked about and not applied is no grace at all. Okay? It's the same way with the idea of salvation. If you understand uh, limited atonement, if you understand the fact that, look, God has died for you and God has died for me, 
that wait, there is no limited atonement. According to scripture, it's unlimited atonement. If you understand the concept of sacrifice and salvation, and you can talk about it, but you never embrace it for yourself, then you've cheated yourself out of the fullness of that walk. So wisdom includes application. Look, it's hard to talk about wisdom without talking about three very important aspects of wisdom. Experience, knowledge, and good judgment. You cannot have wisdom without experience. You cannot have wisdom without knowledge. You cannot have wisdom without good judgment. And we could probably continue that list on and on and on and on. And it's reflected in scripture for you and for me. So how does God help us to make decisions? How does God use wisdom to help me and help you in making good decisions? Well, it's rooted most firmly in scripture and we could spend half the day going over scriptures related to wisdom and what it means for for us to embrace that idea of wisdom so for me and for you latching on to the wisdom that God shares with us and helping us to make decisions we begin by asking ourselves a series of questions in this decision that I have to make in these choices that are available for me in this decision I need to ask myself some things first is it moral and is it wise if I reach this conclusion based on what's going on in my life if I've got this decision to make and I choose this thing Will it be moral and will it be wise? Now we base that on teaching from the New Testament. Paul talks about things being moral and things being wise in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, look, everything is lawful, but not everything is profitable. Just because something is moral doesn't mean that it's wise. And that's where the experience comes into the element of wisdom or the element of experience comes into the process of wisdom I should say because it may be moral and it may be wise but it may not be the right time and only experience can tell you when it's the right time so we've got all of these elements that compose biblical wisdom we've got all of these elements that we can know and embrace and then then we begin to ask ourselves the question, so what? So what? Out of the gate we asked, is it moral and is it wise? What's its purpose, basically? What's its purpose? Ask yourself, will it help me love God and love people? If I reach this conclusion, will it help me love God and love people? It is moral. It is wise, but what's the best decision that I can reach that's going to help me love God better and love people better? That's godly wisdom. We ask ourselves, is it going to help me promote God in His kingdom? Which decision that I can reach is going to help me love God better and reach His kingdom more, promote the truth of who He is? Thinking outside of yourself. Wondering what it is that you can do in this decision-making process that's going to affect the kingdom of God and people more for God and His kingdom. Is it going to help me grow as a believer? Because as I grow as a believer, what I do outside the walls of the church has more impact. What I do inside the walls of the church on Sunday and on Wednesday and on the times I'm there serving, that, that's awesome and, and that carries a lot of weight. But it's what I do outside the walls of the church that's going to have more impact on the kingdom. So will it help me grow as a believer? Seeking God's wisdom in that way. Will it help me promote God's glory? Does it help me promote and point to the truth of who God is? In this decision... What decision can I reach that's going to help me bring more glory to God? Why? Why? Well, 
here's the simple truth. We draw this to a close by reaching the understanding, understanding that wisdom, true wisdom, begins with the knowledge of God. True wisdom begins with the knowledge of God. For us, we can't begin to understand the world in the correct light until we reach true wisdom. And even in the personal decisions that we make, even in inquiring and interrogating ourselves, we need to see the world through that particular vein. We need to see the world through that window of knowledge because true wisdom begins with that knowledge. You know, hey, I know that and I've embraced it. What now? What now? What now is to help other people embrace it? That's why you ask yourself those questions. There's a lot of me in those questions. Is it going to help me love God better? Is it going to help me love other people better? Is it going to help me this, that? How is it going to affect me? And that matters not because you're self-centered. It matters because in that self-centeredness, in your growth, in your relationship with God, in making these decisions and reaching the correct decision, you have the power to influence others and allow them to understand the wisdom that helps you know the truth of who God is and will allow them to tap into the same thing. True wisdom begins with a knowledge of God. Jesus chose several disciples to hang out with him. And over a period of, of three years, he taught them. They lived with him. They walked with him. They did what they needed to do to understand what his mission was here on this earth. And they were pretty good at it. They understood it in such a way that they were able to hear what Jesus was saying and grasp a lot of it, but there were a few things that they had difficulty understanding because their understanding of God was based on the Old Covenant. Jesus had come to help us embrace the New Covenant, and they quite, just quite couldn't understand that. They got close a few times, but they just could not grasp that. So God did his best to try to deliver wisdom to them regarding this new covenant. And he told them time and time again, look, we're going to go down to Jerusalem. And I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men. And I'm going to give up my life. And they couldn't embrace that. They couldn't understand that. They could not appreciate that. So finally he tells them, yes, we're going and we're going to Jerusalem and we're going to celebrate Passover. And they get there and he says, here's some particular things I need you to do for me. And we covered those particular things on Palm Sunday, right? Go and do this, go and do that. Prepare a place for us to celebrate the Passover. And they did. And they understood Passover in the Old Covenant context. Passover in the Old Covenant context is under that ceremonial law that we talked about earlier. Look, you're going to celebrate Passover uh, every year, says God, so you can remember from whence you come. And you know the story. Israel was in captivity in Egypt. They had prayed for 400 years. Finally, God had relented and used Moses to help deliver them from that slavery. And he visits ultimately what would be ten plagues on Egypt before Egypt relents and allows the Israelites to go. And that last one, boy, was a doozy, right? God told Moses, you go and you tell Pharaoh that um, he needs to let us go. But you tell the Israelites this, tonight the death angel is going to visit Egypt. And 
you Israelites need to slaughter a lamb and you need to spread the blood of that lamb over your doorpost and that way when the death angel comes by your house it's going to pass you over if it's not there then like the Egyptians your firstborn is going to die and so it came to pass and the Israel or the Egyptians released the Israelites and God told them as they are on the other side moving toward the promised land you've got to mark this ceremony the Passover what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples is that now with my coming and with my sacrifice there will be no more need for the blood of a perfect lamb because I am the perfect lamb and this will be done once for all not once for some my sacrifice will be made once for all and it will be done this is the new covenant and he begins to explain this to them one more time but this time in the upper room after that last supper was completed he does something pretty remarkable as they're all reclining around the table Jesus seeking to help them understand this wisdom takes a loaf of bread lifts the bread asks the Lord to bless it and he passes it to his disciples and he said take eat this is my body broken for you so they did and after they had had an opportunity to pass the bread around he does something very similar with a cup of wine he takes the wine he lifts it to heaven and he asks the Lord to bless it and he passes it to his disciples and he says drink from this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so they did and there in that very elementary way he shares with them not just worldly wisdom but biblical scriptural godly wisdom and he begins the process of ushering in the new covenant this is my body broken for you this is my blood of the new covenant the old things have passed away and the new things have come says Paul here now we commemorate the same thing we draw our hearts together in communion and when we do the typical uh, uh, communion liturgy we give ourselves a three question test right to see if we're fit to come forward and receive communion hey do I love God yes or no do I truly repent of my sin yes or no and do I want to live at peace with my neighbors yes or no and when we answer those in when we affirm those things we we come and we take communion to participate in this commemoration of the Passover to remind ourselves that we are bound together now with a godly wisdom that helps us not only to decide but to live it binds us together so that we know and we understand that we're bound not just by worshiping one Savior but we're bound by his living spirit and so we gather in communion with one another and that's what we do today we take the knowledge that God has given us we take the wisdom that he shared with us and we reach the conclusion that he is exactly who his word says he is and that he is for us exactly what he came to be pray with me loving God Heavenly Father pour out your presence on us gathered here today and on these gifts of bread and wine make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may move into the world and be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood as we struggle through this world that is filled 
with dichotomy, that is filled with separation, that is filled with angst. Oh God, bind us together with your true sacrificial love. As we come to your communion table this morning, help us, Father, to know, to do, to be everything that you've created us to know, do, and be, that your kingdom may be advanced here. This is our prayer. We offer it with humility, with boldness, in your precious name. Amen. Those who are assisting with communion would come forward. in just a moment I'm going to invite you to line up along the outside walls and come forward and receive communion today you're going to receive both elements and uh, take them where you stand so in other words when you receive the bread and the wine take them right there and as you move back toward your seat up the center aisle you will pass the altar if you wish to stop and pray at the altar you are more than welcome to do that I invite you to take time out and make this communion special by sharing yourself with God either here at the altar or quietly in your seat. Let me remind you that as you are standing along the walls or moving back to your seat, uh, that uh, we are to maintain an air of reverence as we are allowing other people to move ahead and behind us and participate in this time together. So I invite you now to come and line up as you feel led and begin to receive the elements and I will share with you uh, some important scripture readings. Come and partake. The table is open. Paul said, everything is permissible for me, 
but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised Jesus from the dead and he will raise us also. Jesus asked the man, what is your name? Legion, the man replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. When those tending the pigs saw that Jesus had sent the demons into the pigs, they went and reported what they had seen. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. When Jesus arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but only asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told him, Give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Jesus asked his disciples, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. If anyone would come after me, says Jesus, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because I have a friend of mine on a journey. And they've come to me and I have nothing to set before them. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is locked. My family and I are in bed and I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you the truth, says Jesus. Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you.
friends, we thank you so much for joining us on this special communion Sunday. We are delighted that you have taken time out of your week to be with us here in the sanctuary or online, either one. If you'll please stand together now, I will offer the benediction, and we can all head out to the beach and watch the air show, right? I've never gotten an alert bay before telling us not to go to the beach on Back Beach, but I did yesterday. So if you go, be careful. Receive this benediction. Now let us take the wisdom of God into the world, not in a way that puffs us up, but with love that builds us up. Don't worry, you will not do this alone. You will do this with the love of God, with the peace of Christ, and with the power of the Holy Spirit moving you forward. In his name and for his glory, amen. Thank you for coming.